Uh, before I start, do you have any question about the homework? The second homework and also uh, the homework number one that I I already grade. Okay, do you have any any question about um, the homework? Anything? Yeah, uh, I can have a question about uh, assignment two. Yeah, Go yeah. ahead. Uh, five, 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 five. Yes, uh, I cannot hear you clearly. Oh, okay, let, let me explain my problem. Do you hear me? Yeah, but it's not that clear. Yeah, so yeah. Maybe you can you can type your question in the chat box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. มีใครมีคำถามอะไรไหมครับเกี่ยวกับการบ้านที่ผมส่งคืนไปแล้วก็การบ้านครั้งที่สองมีไหมครับอันโอเคอยู่ด้านวิทโอเคอ่ม for the choice of the initial admissible displacement field that I I suggest you to um to shoot to prove um the first and the second problem right um the first one I um the first The, the first question I I asked you to to use the principal virtual work to prove that equation right and and the second one I I asked you to use the principal complementary virtual work so um, based on the two principles uh, you know that okay for the first one when when you know that the body is in equilibrium so now so so principal virtual work just imply that um, The virtual work equation is satisfied for any choice of the virtual um, virtual displacement field. So the key of that problem, you need to choose the appropriate admissible displacement field. I understand that it's it's somehow difficult, but you can try because uh, if you cannot if you cannot be successful at the first time when you guess the displacement field. You can try the other one. You can try like this until you get the appropriate one. So I suggest you to look at the equation that you want to prove. That will tell you something about the choice of the admissible virtual displacement. Okay. Yes, as um, I. I cannot tell you the form. Or I cannot tell you the choice of the admissible virtual displacement field. Because if I tell if I tell you the form, you don't need to do anything. You just simply plug it in. You 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 done. You know what I mean, right? So so I cannot tell you the form of admissible virtual displacement field. You have to pick the appropriate one. Once you get the appropriate one, you can just simply uh, use the principal virtual work, and then you can prove what I asked you to do to prove. Okay. Yeah, that's all. I'm still. Okay, so I cannot tell you the form because that's the key of the solution. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I I ask you to apply the principal virtual work to prove that equation, but I didn't ask you to prove principal virtual work. You know what I mean, right? Because um. I, I didn't ask you to prove the principle of virtual work. I proved that principle um, in the lecture already, right? I proved that for you um, uh, last time, right? I, I proved that. So don't prove it again. You just simply apply the principle of virtual work to prove something else. 
Okay, don't try to prove the principle which will work. Okay, so you you can just simply um you the equivalence between um for example uh, the principle which will work just simply tell you the equivalence between equilibrium and virtual work equation. The two are equivalent, okay? Just use that equivalence to prove um, the, the, third, the third equation in problem one. For the problem two, the principle complementary virtual work just simply uh, states the equivalence between the compatibility of the strain field and um, the complementary virtual work equation. Okay, so the two are equivalent. So just use that equivalence to prove um, the, the second equation. Okay, in, in that assignment. Okay, the key you just simply think about the appropriate choice of the virtual displacement field for the first problem and um, the appropriate choice for the virtual straight field for the second problem. Okay. How can we get the appropriate form? Just look at the final equation that you want to prove. That will tell you something, okay? Okay. I, let, let me move to um, the remaining theorems. Um, I show you the proof of a pair of theorems, the principal virtual work and principal complementary virtual work, okay? And the remaining three theorems that I will mention today, I will not prove um, all of them, but I just mentioned the statement of the principal and, and, and tell you uh, the application of the principle uh, to, to obtain the alternative formulation of the boundary value problems, okay? So, so let, Let's look at the principle of stationary total potential energy. Uh, this one results directly from the principle virtual work. Or I can say that this principle can be proved um, by principle virtual work. You can try, okay? I, I didn't show the proof here, okay? Um, Let's look at body, okay? Let's let, let, let look at a body omega. Let's say that again, okay, this body is made of hyperelastic material. Okay, I will, I, will, I will tell you in a moment what hyperelastic material is. Okay, so let's say that again, okay, the body omega here uh, is made of um, a hyperelastic material and the body is subject to uh, the body force field B and the traction T0 on the surface ST. Okay. And on, on the remaining surface, we know the displacement field U0. Okay, this is the body that we focus on. Okay. So now the statement of the statement of the principle is simply like this. From a set of all kinematically ki kinematically admissible displacements. Okay, I look at a set, a set of displacement field that is kinematically admissible. Um the term kinematically admissible, I will define in a moment. Okay, let's say that, okay, we, I have a set of um, all kinematically admissible displacement field. Okay, uh, one that produces the total potential energy stationary is the correct displacement field of the given body here. Okay, Th this is the principle. It's very, you know, the, the statement here is very, very concise, okay? Um, I look at the body. The correct displacement field of the given body here is simply um, the one that sits in a set of all kinematically admissible displacement, the one that produces the total potential energy stationary, okay? is the correct answer for the displacement field. Okay, before I um, I talk about the principle, I think it is better to define some of um, technical terms that involve in 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 the statement of the principle. The first one, the hyperelastic material. What is that? 
Do you have any idea about this? Actually, the, the, the term hyperelastic is not new to you. I think uh, Professor Thiel Pong introduced this term before when he talked about the hook law, right? So um, a material is called hyperelastic if and only if there exists the strain energy density function u bar. Okay, so if there exists the strain energy density function u bar, which is a function of strain field, and stress is defined like this. Okay, so whenever strain energy strain energy density function exists, and stress can be obtained from this. Uh, expression. Now we call that the material is hyperelastic. Okay, so hyperelastic material depends on the existence of strain energy density function. If that strain energy density function you borrow exists, we can uh, easily, you know, define strain field like this. The strain component is simply uh, the derivative, the partial derivative of u bar with respect to the strain component, okay? Um, the, the special class of material that you focus on here um, in this class. Um, we focus on linear elastic material, okay? Linear elastic material is simply the one example of hyperelastic materials. It's a special case, okay? Um, for linear, hyperelastic material, strain energy density function takes uh, a particular form like this. It takes the, the quadratic form. Whenever you bar take this particular form, now we call that material is linear hyperelastic material. Okay, so you bar take this special form. Okay, it's simply one half C I J K L epsilon I J epsilon K L. Okay, so C I J K L here you know, it's simply a constant tensor, fourth order tensor, okay? So uh, if you apply the expression here, you can get the relationship between stress component and strain components like this. So you get sigma ij equal to um, the partial derivative of u bar with respect to with respect to epsilon ij. So, so uh, u bar is given explicitly in terms of the strain component. So now you can take uh, partial derivatives of this quantity with respect to epsilon ij. So now you, you're gonna get something like this. Okay, finally, you get the hook law that you saw in Ajahn Thiropong part. Okay, so linear elastic material is simply um, hyper elastic material with strain energy density function given like this, okay? So for the general hyperelastic material, the behavior may, may, may be nonlinear, okay? It can be nonlinear. The linear elastic material is simply a special case of hyperelastic material, okay? And the one that we focus on here is simply linear material, okay? Stress and strain are related by um, linear um, relations like what you saw here, okay? Um, what do I mean by the displacement is kinematically admissible? Okay, if I say that the displacement field is kinematically admissible, it, it means what? The displacement field have to be sufficiently smooth. It have to be smooth in the sense that strain can be generated from that displacement field, okay? Sufficiently smooth implies um, the existence of derivative of the displacement field or the gradient of the displacement field exists because you need to compute strain at any point in the body. So, so if the displacement field is not smooth enough, you cannot take the, the, the uh, derivative of that field. So now you cannot produce a drain. We don't care about 
about the displacement like that. So we just care about the displacement that can produce strain field. Okay, so so the first requirement that we we post on the displacement field is it have to be sufficiently smooth. Okay, and also it satisfies the essential boundary conditions. So we know that the displacement field can be the solution of this problem. One of the condition is the boundary condition on the surface SU have to be satisfied, right? So, so if the displacement field cannot be equal to U0 on that surface, now we don't care about that displacement field because it cannot be the solution of the problem. Okay, so I just simply look at the displacement field that can produce a drain and can satisfy um, the barry condition on the surface SU. Okay, the part that we know the displacement field. Okay, so we just simply care about the displacement that satisfy these two conditions. Or the displacement field that satisfy these two conditions is called kinematically admissible displacement field. Okay, there, there are infinitely infinite number of displacement fields that satisfy these two requirements. Okay, if I consider a set of all kinematically admissible displacement fields, that set is infinite set, it's uncountable. Okay, so the number of elements in that set is infinite. Okay. Now, how can we define the total potential energy? Okay, the total potential energy is simply what? It's simply a functional defined for any kinematically admissible displacement U. Okay, let's say that, okay, I have a set. Okay, this is a set. Let's say that this is a set S. And the set S here, sorry. A problem with the drawing here. Okay, let's say that this is a set S. Okay, this set contains all kinematically admissible displacement. Let's say that you sit inside. Okay, the second. I have a problem here. Okay, let's say that, okay, you here is um, any kinematically admissible displacement field. Okay, now I can define the total potential energy. I use the symbol pi here. So I can get the value of pi for any U that sit in this set. Okay, I can define pi in terms of U like this. It's simply a functional, okay? A functional is simply a function of a function. So, so now I, a second. Okay, I, I define pi or the total potential energy um, equal to the sum of strain energy then uh, strain energy of the body and the load potential. Okay, so I define pi in terms of u and, and w here. Okay, um, for the first term, for the strain energy of the body, this, this should be um, clear to you, right? You know how to define the strain energy of the body. When you induce the displacement to the body, okay? So you introduce the, the movement to the body. So the movement can generate strain and the work done due to that deformation will, will be stored in terms of the internal energy that we call the strain energy, right? So strain energy can be um, simply um, compute based on the formula that I gave you here. Whenever you know um, U bar strain energy density in terms of strain, because we just simply focus on only on a uh, hyper elastic material. So strain energy density function is known, right? U bar is known as a function of strain. Whenever you, you introduce displacement U, you can compute strain easily, right? 
because when you know displacement, you plug it in in strain displacement relationship. Now you can get strain. Once you get strain, you can get U bar because the material is hyper elastic, right? So now you can perform the integral of U bar over the whole body. Now you you get strain energy. Okay, that definition should be clear to you, right? So you learn about this before in the first part. Now the second one here. I can define um, the load potential. The load potential is simply the potential induced by uh, the external uh, force, okay, through the displacement that you introduce to the body. Okay, you can think about this is the uh, negative work done due to the constant body force and constant traction on the surface st over the process constant over the process so this is simply the negative work done right so so we define the load potential in a simple way like that so so you think about um b and t zero here are um body force and traction that are constant over the process and u here is simply the displacement of the body so so this term is simply the negative work done of the external force right so so when you combine the two here, now we call the result, the total potential energy. So based on this definition, you can see that um, any given displacement U in this set, it will give you one real number. Because when you plug in U into this formula, you get one real number. It can be positive and it can be negative. That real number we call the total potential energy. Okay, it's simply like that. So, so you can think about the total potential energy part here is the mapping from a function that sit in that set through uh, uh, to the the real number or the the number in the real line. Okay, so that that is the mapping that I talk about. Okay, so this is the way that we define the total potential energy. Okay, it's simply a functional that map from a set, a uh, map from a set of function to uh, the real line. Okay, is that clear to you? Um, if I say that the function, the, the functional part here is stationary at u, what does it mean? Because pi here is, is not a function, it's a functional. So it's a function of a function. If you try to get um, the value of u that make pi stationary, it's, sim it's similar to when you look at a function. If you, if you try to get um, the stationary point of a function, what, what, what will you do? If I give you a function, let's say that I give you a function of a uh, function f, and f that a function of x, okay, if you want to, to get the stationary point, how, how can you get that? The stationary point of a function is simply the point that you have zero slope, right? Is that right? Okay, let's say that I gave you a function f, a function of x. Now, sorry, I have problem with the mouse here, okay? Now I have a function like this. Okay, if you if you try to get the stationary point, stationary point is a point that that produce um, the rate of change equal to zero, or the the point that produce um, zero slope. Okay, so that that is the point that I call the stationary point, and this is also the stationary point of a function, and this one is also a stationary point. Or I can say, I can say that the point that produces the slope equal to zero are called the stationary points. Okay, so if you want to to get the stationary point of a function f, it's very simple, right? You just simply take the derivative of a function f and and set that equal to zero, and now you can get x. Okay, but if you deal with the functional, it's, it's a little bit more complicated because 
pi is not a function. Pi is a function of a function. So if you try to get a stationary point, you cannot just simply take derivative of pi with respect to u because u is not x. u is a function of x. You can think in that way. So, so how can we get the stationary condition for, for the function of pi? So this is the, uh, the thing that, that we learn from calculus of variation. I am not sure that um, Ajahn Tirapong um, taught you in math class or not. If he didn't cover that in math class, I suggest you to, to read um, the book, the basic book in, in calculus to talk about the calculus of variation. So they will define um, the condition for the functional to be stationary. Okay, here I would I would just simply give you the definition. Okay, I don't have enough time, um, you know, to to prove all this. Okay, so if if we we say that the, the functional pi is stationary at u, it implies that the first variation vanishes at u. So the first variation here is equivalent to the first derivative of a function, but pi is not a function, so, so we will not use the term derivative, okay? We will not use the, the term first derivative of a function, but we use the, the term first variation, okay? So the function pi is stationary at u if its first variation vanishes at u, or mathematically, this condition have to be satisfied. This is the condition that the first variation vanishes. Okay, so how can we get the first variation in detail? We just simply take any delta u. Let's say that delta u here is any any uh, variation of the displacement field. Okay, because u plus h multiplied by delta u, h here is simply a scalar. Delta u here is simply the perturbation. Okay, you perturb the displacement fill u by delta u scaling with the real number h, okay? So part um, u plus h delta u have to be a member of this set s. It have to be um, admissible, kinematically admissible. So delta u here have to be zero on that part of the boundary, right? To make sure that u plus h delta u sit in that set. Okay, so you just simply get the formula of pi at a function of h in that way. And then uh, if you fix u and delta u, now the pi here is simply a function of h. Now you can take the first derivative of this with respect to h. Because if you look in terms of h, pi here is a function. For the fixed u and fixed delta u, okay, pi is simply a function of h. Now you can take derivative of that quantity with respect to h and you set that h equal to zero. Okay, that we call the first variation of pi. And if we need the function of pi stationary at u, we need to set the first variation equal to zero. So that is the condition that I talk about here. So, so pi is stationary at u if and only if this derivative for h equal to zero is zero. And it has to be zero for every choice of delta u, for any perturbation delta u. Okay, if this condition is satisfied, now we can say that u is stationary, uh, pi is stationary at u. Okay, it's quite, complicated, right? But if you think about, um, you know, the, the an analogy to um, the, the simple function that you learned before. So this is simply, see, this simply the first derivative of a function equal to zero, right? So it's similar to, um, you know, the definition of, of the stationary point of a, a function, okay? We just simply take derivative with respect to x and then set that equal to zero, we get that stationary point. This is similar, but 
we didn't take the first derivative directly because uh, pi is not a function of x, it's a function of u. And u here is a function, okay? Um, the stationary condition here can be reduced, you know, can be reduced uh, to a simpler condition in, 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 in some sense. Okay, if the material that you mentioned, if you if you focus only on the linear elastic material, okay, the stationary condition here can be can be changed to the minimum condition. Okay, the functional pi for the linear elastic material, the stationary point is simply the minimum point. Okay, or I can say that the point that the the point or the, the function u that produce the functional pi stationary also give you the minimum value of pi as well. Okay, this is true only for the linear elastic material. Okay, so the stationary condition can be um, changed to minimum condition. Okay, I will not prove this. It can be proved using the principle of virtual work. You can try. Okay. Next, uh, what do I mean by U is a correct displacement field? This should be the easy part, right? Because you learned before, U is a correct displacement field of the problem if satisfy Navier's equation, right? So if, if you satisfy Navier's equation and also satisfy the essential barrier condition on the surface SU and also straight field that generated by that U also satisfy the traction barrier condition or on the natural barrier condition on the surface SD. So now we can say that U is a correct displacement field. Okay. So now I think that you are ready to, to visit, uh, you know, the principle again, right? Because now you know all the terms that appear in that uh, principles. Okay. If you go back to look at the principle again, you, you get what? Form a set S here. If you look at a set S that contains all kinematically admit, admissible displacement field. Okay. The one that sit in that set that produce the total potential energy stationary, that one is the correct solution of the displacement field. That is the principle. That is the principle of stationary total potential energy. Okay. Is that clear to you? Is that clear? Do you have any, any question about this? So if, if you look at the principle carefully, this will allow you to replace this condition. We have the condition for, for the correct displacement field and the condition for the total potential energy stationary. Okay, these two conditions are equivalent okay if you try to verify that the displacement is a correct displacement field of a given body you can verify by check the stationary condition of the total potential energy is that if or not if that displacement produces total potential energy stationary. Now we can say that you that you is the correct solution. Okay. So this allow you to replace what you have before the formulation that you 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 did before in terms of the displacement field. Okay. You know that how you know you know how how to check the displacement to be the you know the, the solution of the problem right if you look at the definition down here, so we, we depends on the, the Navier equation, right? So instead of doing 
in this way. Now we have um, the alternative way to check uh, the correctness of the displacement field by simply form forming the total potential energy and then and, and check the stationary condition of that you. Okay. Is that clear to you? So this uh, allow us to apply the principle of stationary total potential energy, um, you know, to formulate um, the alternative form of the value value problem. Okay, so let's look at this problem. Before we can formulate this problem by simply choosing the displacement as the key unknown, if you remember. Okay, we can formulate this problem by choosing the displacement alone as the key unknown, right? And and the equation that you have to satisfy is Navy equation, if you remember. And also you have to satisfy the two body condition, right? So uh, instead of formulate the problem in that way, now I can replace the Navy equation and the essential and natural body condition by the minimization of the total potential energy functional over a set of all kinematically admissible displacements. Okay, this is only this is valid only for linear material because I change the stationary condition to uh, minimization because for linear elastic material the two condition there um, are equivalent. Okay, so this allow us to um, get the alternative form of the formulation in terms of the displacement field. So U bar that I mentioned to you before, this um, strain energy density function that we express in terms of strain components for the linear case, it take this quadratic form, right? So I can replace epsilon ij, epsilon kl in terms of the displacement component. Um, I use strain displacement relationship, I plug that thing in. Okay, and then I manipulate with the symmetry of CIJKL. We know that CIJKL have the symmetry, right? Uh, with respect to the index I and J and the index K and L. So now we can just simply reduce from the one that we have here to the to, to one here. Okay, because CIJKL is symmetric with respect to the first and the second pair of the indices. Okay, this can be proved easily. So now I can express U bar in terms of the displacement component like this. Okay, so now I, I am ready to uh, formulate um, the boundary value problem. I call the option two. If you go back to the previous lecture, previous uh, so lecture one, that I talk about the formulation of, of the boundary value problem, the option two that I talk about there, I formulate the problem in terms of uh, displacement field, right? I do Navy equation. Now I just simply replace by this one. This is the equivalent um, formulation in terms of the displacement field. So I, I need to find the kinematically admissible displacement field U that minimize pi that given below here, okay? So this is the equivalent formulation, equivalent to the one that I expressed in terms of the displacement, the AV equation and, and essential natural body condition. So, so you can see that. So if you formulate the problem in this way, now you don't need to deal with that equa Navy equation anymore. You don't need to um, check the natural and essential body condition because it is combined into this formulation automatically. For example, the essential body condition on the surface SU is combined into the formulation through the kinematically admissible condition, right? Because this implies that I don't care the displacement that cannot satisfy that condition. I just simply look only the one that we call kinematically admissible ones, okay? The one that satisfies that condition okay and the natural body condition is combined into um, pi here you can see that this is the part that related to the natural body condition here right okay 
So this formulation is very useful when you try to, to solve the problem using a finite element approach. You will learn this again uh, next semester if you plan to take finite element class. Okay, so this is the starting point um, for that, um, you know, technique as well. You can you can start from from uh, you know the minimization of the total potential energy. Okay, so form formulating um, the you know the the condition in this way is very useful. Okay, I will not I will not talk about this in detail. You will learn more in finite element class. Okay, so here I just simply provide you um, the alternative formulation in terms of the displacement using the principle of stationary total potential energy. Okay. Okay. Do you have any question about anything here? If not, I will move to the other theorem. Okay. I look at the principle of stationary total complementary uh, total uh, potential energy. So I just simply add the term complementary here. So this is, I can say that this is the complementary um, part or complementary pair of the one that I just showed you before. Okay, because I I I I show you before that the principle complementary will work. The second theorem that I proved for you that is the complementary pair of the principle will work. This is similar. Okay, so this principle can be proved using the principle of complementary virtual work. The fourth theorem here can be proved by the second one. The third theorem that I just mentioned to you can be proved by the first one. Okay, um, the statement of this principle is very simple too. Okay, just take a look here. Look at a body. Let's say that, okay, we focus on a body omega. Okay, let's say that again, this body is made of hyperelastic material. Okay, we just look at the special case here. If you think about it, it's not very general like the first and the second principle because the material that we, we look at here is simply hyperelastic materials. Okay, so if the body is made of material that is not hyperelastic material, we cannot apply this theorem. Okay. Um, the body that we focus on here is made of hyperelastic material and also subjected to the body force field B. Okay. And on the surface ST, we know traction T0. And on the surface SU, we know that displacement U0. Okay. All this information are prescribed. Okay. Now, the principle just simply states that, okay, for a set of all statically admissible stresses okay or again i can look at a set so let's say that this is a set okay i call this a set s again but s here is simply a set of sigma not displacement okay let's say that s here is a set of all the keyword here is all okay so S is a set of all statically admissible stresses. Any stress field that stat statically admissible uh, are corrected in this set. Okay, now the principle just simply say that the one that sit in that set that produce the total complementary um, potential energy stationary is the correct stress field of this body. Okay, you can see that this is similar to the third theorem, right? Somehow it's, it's similar some, in some sense, right? So now we look at a set of all statically admissible stress field. The one that sit in that set that make total complementary potential energy stationary is the correct stress field of the body here. Okay, there are several terms that you have to understand in, in, in this statement, right? For example, statically admissible, what, what, what does it mean? And how can we define the total complementary potential energy? I, I will show you in a moment. 
but the stationary condition is similar to the one that I mentioned to you before. So st stationary condition um, is defined in the same way. And, and also here, what do I mean by the correct straight field? I will show you down here too, okay? Why don't we look at um, the, first, the first term? Um, the material is hyperelastic. Um, I show you how to define the material that is hyperelastic before, right? In terms of the existence of, of strain energy density function, okay? We can also define um, hyperelastic material in different way, but it equivalent. It, different way, but it's equivalent, okay? So I can define in the way that I showed you before. I can define in this way as well. They are equivalent. They, you do not have any conflict between the two definitions because they are equivalent. We can prove that. Okay. So the material is said to be hyperelastic if there exists the complementary strain energy density function, U bar C, which is a function of sigma. Okay. Okay. If this one exists. If this a complementary strain energy density function exists, now we can say that again, the material is hyperelastic. And strain can be readily defined in terms of U bar C like this. You can see that the definition here is similar to the definition I, I, I showed you before, but um, we define in terms of the complementary quantities, right? Can anyone here tell me what U bar C is? How can we define U bar C? So if you remember, when I talk about the simple case that we have only one component of stress, let's say that we have the unit axial stress. So let's say that this is sigma, okay? We have only one component for stress, and let's say that this is strain, okay? For example, the case that you, you perform the experiment, um, you know, you try to pull the bar, okay? You can compute stress and you can compute strain, right? You, 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 can, you can measure um, the elongation and then you convert that to strain, and now you can make a plot, okay? This is the plot of strain and strain, okay, of the material, okay, that you can get from the experiment, okay? How can we define U bar? If you remember, okay, the area under the curve here is simply U bar, right? This is simply strain energy density function U bar that we defined before, right? I think you learned this from the third part, Okay, this is simply U bar. What is U bar C? How can we define U bar C? U bar C here is simply the complementary part of U bar. Or the one that when you combine with U bar, you get the area of this rectangle. Okay. So now I can say that this is simply U bar C. The area under the curve with respect to the vertical axis, that one we call U bar C. That is the definition, okay, for um, the, the simple case that we have only one component of stress, okay? So that is simply U bar C. We can, we can easily generalize the definition of U bar C to, you know, to three dimensional um, cases, okay? So let's say that U bar C here exists as a function of sigma, okay? So now if the material um, possess this function or this function exists, now the material is hyperelastic and now we can define strain strain relationship by simply take derivative of U bar C with respect to sigma ij, we get epsilon ij. So this gives you the constitutive law of this hyperelastic material. It's 
it's a little bit different from 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 the one that you saw before because um the one that we have before when we define u bar we can express stress in terms of strain but when we define the constant relationship uh, from u bar c now we can express strain in terms of stress okay they are equivalent Now, if we look at the linear elastic case, let's say that the material that we focus on is linear elastic. This material is hyperelastic, like I, I, I told you before, right? From the previous case, the material, if the material is linear, it's automatically hyperelastic material. So in this case, um, if we look at the linear elastic material, so complementary stress energy density function can be defined in this way. Okay, we can define in terms of stress, in terms of elastic compliance, SIJKL. This one is simply the inward of what? Of CIJKL. So this is the fourth order tensor. We call the elastic compliance. The, this is the inward of CIJKL, the elastic moduli, okay? So this is the form of U bar C for the linear material. We call the quadratic form, okay? So then we can just simply take the derivative of uh, this U bar C with respect to strain component. We get the strain component like that, okay? And this is the formula that you should be familiar with, right? For linear material, we can also express strain in terms of stress, in terms of the elastic compliance, okay? Now you are clear about the hyperelastic material, right? Defined in different way compared with the previous case, right? We define in terms of U bar C, not U bar, okay? And also stress, is term statically admissible if it satisfies the following condition. Stress is called statically admissible if the first condition, it has to be sufficiently smooth. It's sufficiently smooth in the sense that we can perform derivative of that stress field. And also satisfy equilibrium equation with the body for B here. Or I can say that this equation has to be satisfied. So sigma ij comma j plus bi have to be zero at even any point in, in this body. So now we can say that stress is in equilibrium. And also it have to satisfy the natural boundary condition on the surface ST. Or when you multiply sigma by n, you have to be equal to T zero. If all three conditions here are satisfied, we say that stress is, is statically admissible, okay? Stress that satisfy all three conditions here is not unique. There is infinite number of straight field that satisfy all of this. Okay, when we put all when we put all stress fields that are statically admissible in a set into a set, that set is infinite set. Or I can say that for a given body here, straight field that satisfy all three conditions here is not unique. You have infinite number of straight fields that can satisfy all three conditions, okay? Now, how can we define the total complementary potential energy pi C? I use the symbol pi c here, okay? Um, this is the common symbol that people use to, you know, to define the total complementary potential energy, okay? So this is simply the functional again, okay? It's a functional, just a second. Just a second, I will be back. <laughs> 